A lot of people truly consider Call of Duty Advanced Warfare to be the game that brought upon the downfall of the Call of Duty series forever, and if not the entire franchise, many of those consider Advanced Warfare to be the point where at least things changed, certainly forever. Not just in terms of mechanics, but also in the way that content was distributed. Advanced Warfare, for good and bad reasons, really did signal a new era for COD in a variety of ways. It's kind of strange to think now, I, I would wager most people would look at this run of games and think to themselves, surely this was the golden age of COD. This was back when things were good and the game themselves were fantastic. But believe it or not, a very large complaint brewing within the Call of Duty community at that time was the fact that the games were getting stale. Essentially, each game was a copy and paste of the previous one with very minor differences when it comes to core gameplay. The community was begging for something different from COD, especially after the wet bag of rocks that was COD Ghost. We needed a refresher, something that made us uncomfortable and challenged our presuppositions about what Call of Duty really is, and we would sure get it. Starting out, right, I was trying to please everybody, right? Remember that? We're trying, like, you never try to please me, just for the record. I can't, it's impossible. So it's not everybody you're trying to please. <laughs> All right, that's a good point. I only say that to illustrate that even at the height of COD's relevancy, there was always still something to complain about. It's not like there was ever this period in which that wasn't happening. Anyways, Advanced Warfare, I would argue, completely changed the way that video games now handle monetization, and if nothing else, is one of the primary suspects at popularizing loot boxes within the gaming landscape, and the entire controversy that that would entail. Being able to make content that was at its fundamental core, gambling online for young, impressionable kids was something totally unregulated back then. We have actual laws in place now about that kind of stuff, but it really took some time for those things to be implemented. It was also responsible for much meme culture that even resonates to this day. People on the internet typing F when something sad happens is a direct reference to the funeral mission in this game. Mountain Dew being irreversibly associated heavily with gamers and, and MLG culture. Advanced Warfare brought about the Wild West, as it were, for loot boxes, blatantly shameless monetization tactics, skill-based matchmaking, and so on. This would truly be the end of an era and the beginning of a brand new one. Advanced Warfare also seemed to be a prime example case for developer and publisher once being almost entirely at odds with each other. Advanced Warfare was developed by Sledgehammer Games, and Sledgehammer was originally brought on during the dumpster fire of the development cycle that was Modern Warfare 3 to help finish up that game, but that's a story for another day. Basically, Infinity Ward was falling apart and needed extra manpower to complete the game on time and get it shipped. Thus, Sledgehammer Games was brought into the fold. Activision also decided to break tradition with Call of Duty in another interesting way. Not only was this the first COD game to be developed entirely by Sledgehammer, this would also signal the end of the two-year dev cycle, whereas before, Call of Duty games would operate back and forth, Infinity Ward and Treyarch would just go on and off here making games taking turns. Sledgehammer comes along, and this is the first game in Call of Duty history to break that streak and have a full three-year development cycle. An important note because that's still the same format we have in 2022. Did Advanced Warfare really deserve the reputation for being the end of Call of Duty as it were? Were there some redeeming qualities to this game and did it change some things actually for the better? Fuck it. Let's do this. Well, let's find out if Advanced Warfare was truly responsible for the death of Call of Duty. Um, the other cool thing, you know, because we've been on this product, on this, on this vision, on this game goal for two and a half years now, we're seeing things today. I didn't even realize I picked up my licorice. My Twizzler. Sorry. Advanced Warfare found itself in the unfortunate position of coming out directly after COD Ghost. COD games are generally influenced, either positively or negatively, by the previous game that released before. The reason why Call of Duty Ghost initially sold really well is because people loved MW3 and Black Ops 2, but when they realized that game was subpar, that sort of tarnished the reputation, and that carried on through Advanced Warfare. We can see with Advanced Warfare's sales numbers, there began and continued a really sharp decline uh, for the series, and now Sledgehammer Games was pretty much placing all their bets on this new style of Call of Duty to bring about a new era. 
And as mentioned earlier, Sledgehammer was the main dev of this project, who at the time was ran by Glenn Schofield and Michael Condry, who are currently no longer with Call of Duty and haven't been for some time now, but they had a vision to take COD in an entirely brand new direction, breaking all the rules that had previously defined the series. It's important to acknowledge that AW had a fairly long dev cycle at, again, three full years, starting right after the release of Modern Warfare 3, and from what I understand, was a relatively smooth process compared to some other COD games that have had nightmare development cycles. So with that in mind, shouldn't this game have been pretty great then? Well, it's complicated because I think there's some ideas that are actually excellent and the execution of many of those ideas are very solid, but it's got some obvious shortcomings that may turn some people off. It's also pretty wild to me, I would make the argument that AW is still Sledgehammer's visually best looking Call of Duty game even in 2022. Between what they were able to accomplish with the next generation of hardware at the time, a fantastic art direction, I've always said, for all the problems the gameplay has, visually it was always nice to look at. Such a hard 180 from the previous like grim and, and bland color palette from Ghost. This managed to be pretty without taking you out of the experience. Also, Advanced Warfare would have the most amount of sheer content a COD game has seen in, I I'd argue, a really long time. Instead of the three main pillars we typically have, AW had four, single player campaign, multiplayer, exo survival, and exo zombies. Well, not at first, but don't worry, we'll get to that. And, um, uh... So at least you can make the correct claim that Advanced Warfare was truly loaded with content. The full three-year development cycle really showed. Unfortunately, most of Advanced Warfare's problems come from the systems that Activision began to push and implement. In fact, I forgot about this until recently researching this video, but some of you may remember, if you played AW right when it came out, Glenn Schofield and Michael Condry said that they would never sell or monetize supply drops, and there was actually a small window of time in the game in which you literally couldn't purchase supply drops at all. They were only earnable via playing the game, and this didn't last too long, obviously, and that cascaded into a string of tons of other issues. Also, AW meant the end of an era of COD taking itself somewhat seriously. And um, what was the other question? Every game prior, for the most part, tried to be somewhat realistic at least, had actual, you know, military player models, relatively realistic aesthetics and that kind of thing, but Advanced Warfare then comes along and says, LOL, that's cute, and adds the most bizarre looking cosmetics that have ever been in video games. This was another heavy point of contention, and no matter how you felt about it, it really was the end of an era to some extent, and the start of a new one. So, the real puzzle is here, how did such a good, on paper Call of Duty game end up being partially responsible for tainting the Call of Duty reputation. To understand that, we're going to have to get into specific details of the game. Like I said, Advanced Warfare actually had four pillars of content to offer, so there's quite a lot to unpack. But with that said, let's get into the single player story of Call of Duty Advanced Warfare. I think we're, we're conservative. Um, and... Uh... Hey, just want to quickly throw in there, if you're enjoying these videos, I have tons of other reviews on COD games you can watch after this one if you want to see more, but if you're enjoying this one, be sure to drop a like. These take a ton of work to make, but I'm having a lot of fun with them, and it only takes a second of your time, it'd be greatly appreciated. And if you're new and you want to watch the entire series, make sure to subscribe and stick around. Around 80% of you guys have not subbed to the channel yet, but we are at the almost very finish line for half a million, which is unbelievable. Thank you very much for the support. And if you want to support even further, you can become a channel member. I've been playing with members of my community uh, for multiplayer lobbies and stuff and getting games and gameplay that sort of thing to actually help fill up these lobbies that are basically impossible to play for so if you want to come and hang out with me sometimes while i'm reviewing these call of duty games you can become a member obviously no obligation you never have to i appreciate the support on the series it's been absolutely overwhelming but anyways back to the video just want to say that this game looks awesome just the set here right now it's so exciting to be here and um everything i've heard about the exosuit and some of the new features sounds really cool and fun to play
All right, uh, I'm just going to come out the gate and say it, and this might shock you, but as it stands, I think the Advanced Warfare campaign is actually pretty good. It's not perfect, mind you. There's a few things that really bothered me, but considering the last campaign I replayed before this was Ghost, this was a wonderful change in direction. You probably won't be surprised at all to hear, Advanced Warfare's campaign was written and created by the creative minds behind Dead Space. In some sense, you can see the influence, but in most ways, Advanced Warfare really seems like it's doing its own thing. They didn't feel the need to bring in any outside writers this time for the story. Glenn Schofield and Michael Condry just said, hey, this is a story we really want to tell, and I, I think it works in this case. I will say, however, this campaign's strengths are in its plot and a few characters and its beautiful visuals, which are super important. What I'm saying is, it's not the emotional focus of a character story like Infinite Warfare, if that's your thing. Like I said, it has its good characters, but the main grip of this single player is the literal plot itself and a pretty interesting main villain. Sledgehammer would go out of their way to ask Activision if they could get Kevin Spacey for the bad guy of this game, although uh, they would later regret that decision. Our British prosecutors are charging actor Kevin Spacey with four counts of sexual assault against three men. Oh. I'm not a monster. That's what Kevin Spacey said. <laughs> At that time, Kevin Spacey was a well-respected and beloved actor from House of Cards, famously, and, and a few other roles, but shortly after Advanced Warfare was made is when all the allegations against him would begin to surface. This also killed the potential of a sequel, but we'll get to that soon. I'd say odds are good that you guys are someday going to work on a game called Advanced Warfare 2. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Another advantage this campaign had was had to have a whole new set of technology both to film and create the visuals through. Advanced Warfare has such a distinct look that works in its favor, but besides having a great story, a big name actor turned sex pest, and, a, and stunning visuals, Advanced Warfare's campaign is just a solid experience, and I'll explain why I think that is. Everyone is fair game now. That's what Kevin Spacey said. <laughs> So, the structure of this campaign is something I thought was excellent. It focuses in on one character, Private Mitchell who you play as, but compared to the Ghost campaign for example, this story isn't really about him exactly. He's just a smaller piece in a much larger story. These missions are far more focused on progressing the plot along and establishing the main antagonist, so in the first mission you're under the Marines under Sergeant Cormac and alongside your best friend Will Irons, you help South Korea push back against the invading North Korea and eventually you need to destroy a large gun that will turn the tide of the battle. Will Irons get, grabs the demolition device and plants it only to get his arm stuck in the device and sacrifices himself to save you and finish the mission. It's okay. I'll see you on the other side. However, in the debris that follows, a stray shard of metal comes through and chops your left arm clean off, in a shot that's very tastefully done. Not much is said about Will Irons and Mitchell's friendship, but in this story, it isn't all that important. This leads you to attending Will's funeral, pressing F to pay respects, and inevitably getting contacted by his father, Jonathan Irons, who, of course, is played by not a, a literal criminal. Reason I say this story is focused on plot rather than characters, Will Irons in this isn't so much of a character as he is a plot device. He's simply there to get Mitchell in the role at Atlas after Irons offers him a job in the spot at their company. Atlas is a giant organization with incredibly advanced military that trumps all other nations by decades with technology and is subservient to no one. Basically, they're an unstoppable force for hire, which is a pretty neat concept for a Call of Duty campaign. What you're seeing is advanced warfare. Another thing that's fantastic in these few opening missions is that it takes time to slow down and let you absorb the environment around you. A lot of COD campaigns overstuff themselves with mind-numbing action at every second, but this lets you take it at almost completely your own pace, and just enjoy the world a little bit as you go along. While much of the stuff is good, one complaint I do have is the actual main plot details don't really kick off until about halfway through this campaign. In the first half, you're working with Atlas alongside your pal Gideon, your friend Alona, and some others. You go around stopping sinister activities around the world and, and other nations that have hired Atlas 
Nexus services, the main antagonist at this point is set up to be some guy named like Demon or, or Devil or something. I, I can't really remember right now. Actually, you know what? I'm just gonna call him Red Herring. Point is, he's a bad guy, doing bad guy things, and Atlas needs to stop him to really show the world what they're made of, and of course that will give them more reputation. While in an attempt to stop a chain of nuclear power plant stations around the world from melting down, you fail in your objective, and a worldwide terror attack is pulled off by this man, sending the world into absolute chaos. This is finally where the main elements of this game actually kick off. You're introduced to Atlas becoming a beacon of hope for the world, Iron's cloaking himself in virtue and trying to get the world back on track. Something that always kind of annoyed me about this part is, up to this point, they've done so well at telling the story in-game and not through cutscenes, which they made a deliberate effort to do so, particularly in Advanced Warfare. But the whole collapse of the world and the rise of Atlas is blown by really fast. Again, I get why that's a lot of story to be told there, and we just don't have time for that, but it's just, it's a small nitpick. I just would have liked to see that develop a little bit more. Regardless, you're now in Detroit to extract a VIP chemical expert. You make your way down downtown through bad guys and discover some pretty horrible things. You even end up in a deadly situation when an unknown force who appears to have Atlas-like technology saves you at just the right time. They don't reveal their identities or who they are, however, leaving you knowing that you've just got somebody watching your back at least. So then you've got the chemical expert successfully extracted and you're interrogating him to reveal the location of Red Herring as he's having a meeting somewhere and he knows where it is. Kevin Spacey also basically announces he's sending in Atlas forces in on his authority and with no regard for other nations inputs now. Apparently this scene is a reshoot and Kevin Spacey didn't actually like this. The first read that, that Kevin gives, he goes, on my authority. It, it is just like, that's why you hired Kevin Spacey. You got House of Cards and every other movie and show that comes before it right there. And it was like, oh man, that's so good. And they're like, great job, great. We're gonna go one more time and we just feel like you should be angry. And he goes, angry? He goes, yeah, he goes, okay. And so he comes back and he goes, on who's there? He goes, on my authority and does that whole thing. And they were like, <laughs> That's, oh my God, that's exactly what, he just looks at me and goes, and he goes, now I know what game we're making. I'm like, no, oh, oh, and a part of me died. No. This takes you to a small beach village where he's reportedly holding a meeting. Here, I have to give another compliment to this campaign. It's got a really like wide variety of concepts and types of missions and things just beyond stealth or action. And you'll know what I mean if you've played this campaign. It keeps the gameplay extremely fresh. And after some, you know, stealthing through the village, raiding the safe house to gather intel and documents, you find the location of the meeting to assassinate him. You line up a shot with your drone to take him out, only to find that it was a setup. Red Herring was actually a Red Herring of himself to begin with, and now you're chasing down and confronting the real Red Herring, and you have a brutal fight in the streets. Ultimately, he's killed and confirmed to be the real one, but he leaves you a hint on his dying breath, however. This is another part that bothered me a little bit. I really wish they would have just let the twist play out instead of telling you what's about to happen five seconds later. First, Red Herring says, He knows. Irons knows. Then the very next mission, you're in your cozy position in Atlas, and Gideon says, The world, my friend, is running out of bad guys. It's slightly annoying, yes, but it doesn't get in the way of the experience too much for me. Ilona tells you to meet her downstairs and that she's got something to show you. A planet and attack. He told me everything. What, what kind of attack? Power plants all over the world. They wanted me to compromise the security systems. Where are they planning on hitting? Seattle, Paris, Tokyo. Thousands will die. We have to tell someone. No. We have to tell everyone. It's okay, it's all right. I'm gonna take care of this right now. The execution of this scene, no pun intended, is really well done. It's it's not embarrassing or telegraphed what's about to be said, and best of all, Gideon has mixed feelings about what he just saw, initially siding with Kevin Spacey and betraying his friends. You realize that Irons was completely aware of the attacks and even orchestrated them to his benefit and to make Atlas a true world superpower. But the question is, why does he want that? You're left pondering that motivation while trying to escape Atlas's grip and get out of that town. All 
all of the escape and city traversing sequences, I had a blast within this game. Like I said, this game manages to have action that's fun without being like stupid or obnoxious. It's also very clear what you're looking at and what's happening at all times. You're then rescued by the absolute lad, Sergeant Cormac, who was looking out for you this entire time with his Sentinel team. And you realize those are the people that saved you before. Gideon has you pinned on the rooftop, however, but because he's conflicted, doesn't sell you out and he gives you a chance. Roof is clear. No sign of him. All right. Inside. Now. Overall, really well executed stuff, and this mission was always super memorable to me. So now you're allied with the Sentinels and going against Atlas, the group that was responsible for saving you back in Detroit. And your goal now is to see what Irons is up to and stop him. The mission where you invade his estate might be one of my favorite in this entire campaign. It's just so different the way it plays, and it's so detailed in however you want to approach it. You can hear people talking and having conversations that will give you like little insights into what's maybe going on. Well, something strange is going on, and John will talk about it. As you sneak by the doors and, and so on, eventually you sneak into a meeting area by hiding under one of the cars, and then things get even crazier. You find out the true reason Atlas wants power, you discover Kevin Spacey is making a racist bomb. He's developing a chemical called Manticore that's capable of targeting the DNA of certain people or specific ethnicities while sparing others, and it's about to be weaponized by irons. Everyone under Atlas and subservient to them are immune to Manticore as their DNA is encoded to be immune to the bomb, but everyone not under Atlas is at high risk. Kevin Spacey then announces to the whole world that his goal is to set the world straight and end wars forever. You have outsourced the job to me. I have sent people to die in your wars. So I feel uniquely qualified to tell you, your wars don't work. Obviously, he's hurting that he lost his son in a pointless war. He plans to decimate those who still perpetuate war now. This is where Irons goes from a good to great villain for me. He genuinely believes he's doing the right thing for the world, and despite being a psychopath in his ways, truly thinks he's on the side of the angels. He's not a bad guy because bad. As, as funny as, as it is to compare, it's kind of the same reason why Thanos was an interesting villain in Marvel films. You can truly understand but not agree with his motives. In his mind, mind, eliminating all those empowered now who war with each other would put an end to wars forever. So then you're battling Atlas forces when he pulls the trigger and Kevin Spacey then drops canned racism on the battlefield. What's happening? Knox is down. I need immediate medevac on my location. No, it's manacore. Wiping out the Sentinel forces, but sparing you and your former Atlas friends. You're then taken into capture and put into an Atlas prison. And this mission's great too. Like, this mission genuinely makes you feel powerless, and it takes a long time for that to play out. You can't even turn around without getting slapped or dying. Ice forward! Ice forward! Ice forward! Uh, yeah. Um... You then get put to sleep, and when you wake up, you realize you're captured in a, you know, holding cell with your buddies, and then we have a great scene where Kevin Spacey explains that he's not a monster. Oh, oh, wait, wrong scene. Then we have a great scene where Kevin Spacey explains that he's not a monster. He eventually shoots Cormac, causing him to slowly bleed out, but you're powerless to give him any immediate help. Eventually, you attempt an escape from the prison, Alona grabs Cormac to get out of there, and you and Gideon need to use all of Atlas's tools and equipment to escape. You make it out only to find Cormac's fate. Come on. Come on. Stay with me. We're almost there. Almost there. Almost there. It's not much further. Don't stop. Don't. <laughs> Come on, mm. Cormac! <gasps>
This is a much better emotional scene compared to a lot of the stuff in Ghost or even other COD campaigns. It's more earned, it's not corny, and it spends just enough time on it without indulging or overplaying it. So this takes us to the final act, and this is where things get interesting. All of the stuff where you and Gideon take Atlas gear, destroy the rockets that contain the racist bombs are, are, are all pretty straightforward. It's where we come to the final confrontation with Irons is where things really bothered me. So here's the scene. You're trying to escape and, and you're kind of going to take him out when he shows up. He disables your exosuits with his iPad and he gives you some dialogue about stuff. What I have started won't end with me. It's bigger than me and it's certainly bigger than you. That's what Kevin Spacey said. And this is where things didn't make sense to me. I vividly remember, even the first time I played this, something didn't feel right. Irons has you right where he wants you, disabled exos and all, and then just takes your pistol and, and runs away to do nothing for, for no reason. Like, where are you even going? You, you disable your exo, you chase him down, and you tackle him over a collapsed building. You then take out your knife and ceremoniously cut off the arm that he gave to you. This ending's fine, don't get me wrong, but it's not great. And in fact, it's not even supposed to be what the original ending of this game was as explained by Mitchell's actor. The original ending of oh. the mo uh, the original ending of the game, Far right. um, you're, you're frozen in your mech and I'm sitting there and I've got my gun like this. The original thing is he walks up to you and he goes, he talks about how every movement needs a martyr. Because to really have an effective movement, you need to have a martyr. And so he walks and he puts his head right there and he takes the gun and he puts it right to his head he goes i know what i'm doing and <laughs> he goes bang that's the original ending this would have made far more sense as you can even see him take the pistol from mitchell's hand and looks like he's gonna go for that but then he just does nothing with it and puts it away why didn't he shoot you when when he was getting chased y you know what i mean he clearly had it in his jacket Obviously, this ending was a bit slapped together, and it wasn't the intended ending, sadly. Again, it's passable, I don't hate it, but it's nowhere near as interesting as what should have happened. Also, there was an embarrassing sequel bait at the end. They left the door open technically for the possibility of a sequel follow-up, but as explained by Glenn and Michael, they really just wanted to tell this story, and any other sequel is to be dealt with, you know, when they get there. But the actual plot of this campaign, I have to say, is super strong. There's really no filler missions to speak of very much. Everything's extremely unique, and while it's a fairly long campaign in terms of hours, it never feels like it's beginning to drag on. You can sit down and play this in one sitting really without getting bored or burnt out. There's no multiple endings or side missions to uncover. There's a small mechanic where in between missions you can like upgrade your exo for like better health or recoil control, that kind of stuff. It's it's nice progression, I guess, but it doesn't really matter a whole lot in the grand scheme of things. But what it lacks in those other areas, it makes up for tremendously in good characters, a great plot, and an overall fun and memorable experience. Would it have been nice to see a sequel to the story and possibly with its original ending? Maybe, but I'm happy with the fact of just what it was. Not, not everything I like needs to be done to death. So overall, I consider this campaign to be very good and even above average for Call of Duty, but this also meant the end of an era alongside Ghost because these games weren't the continuation of the story universe that was set up by Treyarch or Infinity Ward. It definitely felt like turning a new leaf for sure, but obviously it would never get any follow-ups, but as far as I'm concerned, it was still pretty excellent in its own bubble. As always, COD campaigns are the basis and building blocks for the multiplayer, so it's time to get into that. Been one of those people who sort of always walked the straight and narrow, did the safe things. I've always sort of been interested in a little bit of disruption, a little bit of chaos. <laughs> So I was flying home from a trip I was recently on, and on the plane, I was thinking about Advanced Warfare's multiplayer for this review when I realized something. It hit me. This is another one of those instances in which I think something has some real serious design flaws, but it's incredibly fun, and let me explain what that means. 
I'm going to start with what I dislike about Advanced Warfare's multiplayer. Firstly, it was hard coming back to Advanced Warfare's movement systems, especially when you consider Black Ops 3 and Infinite Warfare's movement are just done way better objectively. Advanced Warfare's, you know, advanced movement is all over the place. It's jagged, jerky, the movement's not very controllable, it's often unidirectional, and it's just far less refined in almost every way compared to the games that came after it. I have a newfound appreciation for the sophistication of the movement in BO3 and IW for sure. Also, the weapons are horribly balanced in this game. This is most likely due to the fact that they made widely different variants of guns with, you know, stat altering effects, and that means not each weapon can get the careful fine tuning and hand craftsmanship compared to non variant guns, but we'll get to variants in more detail here shortly. But even the base weapons themselves are so badly balanced with one another, basically, the somewhat viable weapon selection or relative competitive boils down to the BAL-27, the ASM-1, and maybe the HBRA-3, although that statement just gave nade shot nightmares. And maybe the more snipe rifle, but really besides that, everything else was so obviously weaker in comparison. Like the AMR9 SMG, it is so bad compared to the ASM1, it's insane they're even in the same class of weapons. Or like the SN6 SMG or the ARX assault rifle. Not to say you can't use these and do well, but they're just so suboptimal, there's basically no reason to choose them over any other of the dominant guns. In fact, my created classes from 20 14 were still the way I had them when I got back on, and I pretty much only ever played the BAL 27 and its variants and the ASM 1 occasionally. And I had a fun, a couple fun guns for you know when I'm messing around. But I, when I went back to replay this game, I tried using other things, but quickly realized that most of the weapons just can't keep up, which is a real shame because there's some incredibly unique and fun weapons potentially. But unless you can actively be okay with being at a pretty substantial disadvantage, you may as well not even bother with these. So, the weapons themselves, and not even including variants, aren't that ideal, but we also need to talk about how the create a class system worked. Advanced Warfare looked at the newly beloved Pick 10 system from Black Ops 2 and attempted to expand on that idea further, thus turning it into Pick 13. So, effectively, everything you selected counted towards that limit, and that includes things like score streaks. So, for example, you could forego all score streaks to run extra perks, or a sidearm, or another grenade, or whatever you like. I thought this was a very interesting idea, but I think potentially taking score streaks out of the equation could be a bit detrimental for some people. But speaking of the score streaks in Advanced Warfare, they are very one of a kind. This was the first COD game to give us upgradable kill streaks. For example, 50 extra score on your Warbird means that it can pilot itself instead of having to manually control it, or extra points on your Paladin uh, gunship will grant you the ability to use rockets and so on. All of these have their own unique upgrades, and this is a cool concept, but it was almost required because the base score streaks themselves really weren't that all that impressive. Really, the only ones worth their salt, in my opinion, and what I practically used for the whole life cycle of the game were the UAV, Warbird, and Paladin. It just feels like there should have been something a bit higher as well, or just more score streaks. Of course, there is the DNA Bomb, which is the nuke equivalent in this game at a 30 gun streak. This time, it doesn't end the game, and it doesn't kill you or your own team only the enemy, but it doesn't really have any lasting effects. It just kills everyone on the enemy team once, and then the game just continues. It just doesn't really feel like it has the impact that it should, but it is cool in its own way. Also, the maps in Advanced Warfare kind of suffer from the same issue I feel has affected many of the futuristic COD games in particular. For some reason, most of the maps are unmemorable and, and bland. However, I will say, Advanced Warfare's base maps are actually pretty good, and they work seamlessly with its movement mechanics, but the DLC maps are a, a bit all over the place. There's not many DLC maps that I actively love in AW, and they just don't stick out to me for any reason in particular. Even the High Rise remake from MW2 loses all its charm here since like, you know, for example, the skill jump can just be boost jumped onto and it doesn't play like high rise whatsoever. The DLC maps are some of the weaker ones I feel like we've seen in quite some time. You know, don't get me wrong, they're all visually very pretty. In fact, some of the maps are so impressive looking, I'm baffled that this is the same studio that made the visual pig slop of World War II and the disgusting filthy look of Vanguard. 
But all in all, the gameplay doesn't stick out to me on any of the DLC maps compared to before. I should also mention this game had a mode that completely disabled Exos. It was classic COD movement, but like literally nobody played this. I've tried it a bit and advanced warfare maps with no Exo are borderline unplayable. Most people probably played that mode once, said hell no, and then never touched it again. Now, one of the things Call of Duty got into hot water about with the community, especially the most in advanced warfare, was skill-based matchmaking. Now, I've been waiting a long time to do this. I want to give my full take on skill-based matchmaking because it's probably not aligned with what most people believe and say, and you don't have to agree with me if you don't want to, but at least hear me out. Now, let me be very clear. I'm not denying the existence of skill-based matchmaking. I'm not saying it isn't an issue or that people's complaints aren't valid. With that said, though, many people still seem to think that AW is where SBMM was introduced. This is not true. Skill-based matchmaking has been in Call of Duty basically forever, and I've spoken to some of the devs who have made those systems in the earlier games. It's just it was way more pronounced in Advanced Warfare for two reasons. Number one, the movement system divided players between those who could effectively use movement and those who could not. This by definition made the skill gap immediately much more visible. It was instantly advantageous to master the movement in MP here, and second, Activision probably did make the SBMM stricter in this game for the reason we just discussed and also they have financial and other incentives in, in doing so. And a third point I just thought of, in, in my opinion, the average skill floor of the COD community has just gone up over the years. Bad players in today's environment would probably be considered average or maybe just below average in older Call of Duty games. People have just simply gotten better at COD over the years. Okay, so my point is yes, SPMM is real and people don't like it, but my real question is why? Why is playing against someone your skill level a problem seemingly only in Call of Duty and to some extent other FPS games? And here's my opinion some of you may disagree with, and that's fine, but the only reason skill-based matchmaking is a problem is because of the nature of the game itself and not skill-based matchmaking as an idea. Call of Duty's core gameplay, when boiled down, is the most fun when you're being a badass. You're getting a lot of kills and kill streaks. We all know this to be true. It's not really fun going one kill for one death in COD in almost any case, minus professional league events. Call of Duty's fundamentals are built around doing significantly better than someone else. The pleasure comes from the domination and prowess over the enemy team. So if Call of Duty was always people equally as skilled as you, and you have a, one, a flat 1KD every every game always, you'd get bored pretty damn quick, just because there's really nothing else to that core gameplay besides getting kills. And I don't think many people would disagree with that. Now, in contrast, let me compare it to another game I really like. I play a lot of Smash Brothers. High level Smash is the exact opposite. It's actually so boring to play against someone less skilled than you. And that's because, again, the nature of the game itself. Without making it sound dramatic, high-level Smash is kind of an art form. It's, it's a dance. You're, you're actively looking for patterns and behaviors in your opponent and adapting to each other in real time. It's essentially real-time chess, and, and the fun is in the dance of Smash. Of course, it's really satisfying to win, and, and you want to, but I can lose a really close game of Smash and still thoroughly enjoy myself, and it's the most fun for me when I'm playing somebody slightly above my skill level. But that isn't the nature of Call of Duty at at all like like do you think a chess grandmaster is sat there like god i'm so sw sick of sweating all the time with these good players it's like no that's what being a grandmaster is is for he or she could easily beat up on any chess newbie but they both have a terrible time same is true in smash in in call of duty however this is where most people would agree it's optimal a randomized batch of both good and bad players and i agree my point in saying all that was spmm as a concept is not the idea to blame exactly. It's the kind of game it's being overlaid on is when it becomes a problem. I hope I made that clear to understand, but I do think people's gripes with it in Call of Duty are valid, and I understand where they're coming from. It's just there's no straightforward solution really that makes everybody happy. But it was a big issue that turned people off from that point forward in this game. Many people quit just due to skill-based matchmaking in Advanced Warfare specifically. And let's get to possibly the worst thing about this multiplayer. Supply drops and weapon variants. As mentioned earlier, for a small window of time, supply drops were truly only able to be earned and not purchased. This didn't last long though as Activision saw a big opportunity here, as did many YouTubers. 
the ability to purchase supply drops was effectively online gambling for game altering weapons it, it felt like it went against the entire core and foundation of sledgehammer games and call of duty in fact michael condre even spoke up about that on twitter once many of these systems as devs they'd prefer not to do but the publisher has certain needs that need to be met and this isn't just an activision thing but you get the point many youtubers as well saw this as an opportunity to make embarrassing and cringe supply drop opening videos a lot of people complain now about content on youtube being low effort but back then weren't exactly the golden days either oh man that got me excited right there <laughs> Yo! let's go baby let's go let's go i'm the luckiest and let's go um This type of content, and especially the popularization of it, were the death of gameplay videos. Up until Ghost, most YouTube content was focused around the actual gameplay. Advanced Warfare changed all that very rapidly. It became about the shop and, and the systems, etc., which, albeit is very different, but is still felt in Call of Duty and the newer games even now, and I think that all really began here. But weapon variants were outrageous in this game, and the only way to obtain them was through pure luck. It sucked for new players who didn't have much unlocked. They can jump into a game with the base BAL-27, but if they're playing against me and my Obsidian Steed variant, as long as I can shoot straight, I'll practically never lose a gunfight to them. But admittedly, these were kind of fun. Uh, I, I have a friend who played the game, uh, a personal friend of mine, way, who played way less than me, like far less, and his supply drop luck was off the charts. He had variants of guns that I wanted and I grinded triple the amount of time for and I still couldn't get. It was annoying, but something that kind of makes me remember this game for some reason. But let me address some things I, I do like about this multiplayer. It's not all bad and I don't have, you know, a ton else to complain about. First and foremost, the actual core gunplay in combination with the movement feels so good to me for some reason. Getting kills is so satisfying in this game. There's a super dope mechanic as well that's essentially like fast reloading by inputting double tap on your you know reload action you drop your entire current magazine but you can get a new one in much faster I wish they still had this in Call of Duty to be honest and it's another one of those things that adds depth to the decision making I quite enjoyed that and uh, I also really like how the maps flow and the pace of game especially when you know lobbies are full feels just right in this context getting killstreak medals for some reason was also super gratifying as well there's some neat things like map specific kill streaks, usually turrets or something to that effect. It feels like this game had a lot of replayability at its core. Maps could even change fundamentally, like pieces of it could be removed and replaced as the match goes on. Also, besides the meta guns, there's no corny or like blatantly overpowered cheese nonsense like in Ghost. In Advanced Warfare, I'm free and even encouraged to play as aggressive as I want without getting punished for moving around the map. It's actually great. The core gameplay loop was so rewarding for some reason, and even though I really think the movement's been done better, it was an excellent first draft of what that style would eventually become. The perk selection is fun, and there's honestly quite a lot to choose from, and the way it, you Know, worked in combination with pick 13 I thought was pretty seamless and also there's a ton of like customization options so I can wear my embarrassing Mountain Dew gear in game it's got an emblem editor leaderboard system and so much more like actually great stuff outside of that and this is where I have sort of an odd conclusion about multiplayer compared to infinite warfare specifically I think IW's multiplayer is objectively a better experience. More refined movement, better kill streaks, more subtle variants, and arguably better map design. But even so, in the face of all that, I have to say, I think I still have more fun with AW's multiplayer, even though I can see objectively it isn't designed quite as well. And I'm not really sure what that is. Advanced Warfare is worse from a technical perspective, yes, but I had more fun with it. So at the end of the day, I think there's a lot to appreciate about this experience and while there were certainly some annoyances especially with supply drops and the systems that plagued the out of game mechanics i really enjoyed myself in this multiplayer both in its prime and when it was out and upon my revisit as well but that'll bring us to the forgotten mode of advanced warfare after multiplayer exo survival
Exo Survival is the co-op mode that Advanced Warfare initially launched with, and you'll recall I said at the beginning, AW had four modes of content, and this will make sense momentarily, but at first, Exo Survival was the premier co-op experience that Sledgehammer intended for this game, so how well does it hold up? The last game to have Survival was MW3, where it was pretty masterfully done, in my opinion. Advanced Warfare takes the concept slightly further by introducing, like, tiers of maps and, you know, more variety, technically, with within uh, the rounds themselves, but you play a certain number of total rounds in these maps to unlock a new set of them and more maps. Ideally, this encourages you to play through all of them. However, this is both a positive and a negative to this mode. It's kind of similar to Spec Ops in the sense that, sure, it's going to give you a couple solid hours of gameplay, but beyond that, it's kind of dead in the water once you've done it all once. I think Exo Survival can get really repetitive, even more so than MW3's version, maybe partly because it feels so grindy to unlock all the maps, but after you've played through all the rounds on four or five different maps, you've kind of done it all already. The core gameplay is just wave-based survival, upgrading your class and your exo and your loadout to better suit you as the waves get progressively harder and with more enemies, and the rounds get harder and harder until 25 when it just starts over and you're on round one squared. It's the same sequence of rounds and enemies over again, just tougher until the game kind of just decides it's time for you to die. Obviously, this mode is meant to be played co-op, it's, it's not really built for solo, but I just don't think this mode has a whole lot of replay value in and of itself. Like I said, play through all the waves on like three or four maps and you've experienced everything it's got to offer already. Well, almost anyways. You may have noticed that the maps are divisible by tiers. Once you unlock tier 4, there is only one map within there, and it's really grindy to get here, but it's by far the coolest map there is. So, you load into this map and go about your typical routine, you're surviving, when after round 10, this happens. Sensors are showing Manticore signatures headed your way. Eyes to the sky! Team, report status. Team, something's headed your way. Fast movers, lots of them. Grab a weapon and ready up. What the hell are these things? <laughs> Team, report. What the hell are we fighting out there? What the hell's going on? This sequence is so cool, and it reminds me of how back in World at War, after completing the campaign for the first time, you'd just be immediately thrown into a zombies map without any warning or context. It was such a fun introduction to the zombies mode in Advanced Warfare, and I hope they can do something like this again in the future. This sequence, unfortunately, doesn't last that long though. After like a minute or so, it's over, and you get a cutscene basically introing Exo Zombies. It's a perfect little taste to it without giving us too much. This is practically the only reason to play Exo of survival more than just a couple of times as the core gameplay is very bare bones and just honestly not all that interesting and the only replay value it has is artificial locking the maps behind you know round completions and the maps tier to tier don't even really play or feel any different as far as i'm concerned exo survival is fine don't get me wrong but it's mostly just to get your foot in the door to exo zombies so let's get through that and get to there Man, I've always had such a hard time growing facial hair, so I, I got these things called Reddit pills. Uh, they're supposed to help my neck beard grow in a little bit faster, so figured, you know what, uh, may as well give it a try. <coughs> oh, oh my god, I, I took way too much. Oh my god, I took the whole thing. Uh, I, I'm sure it's gonna be fine, you know, it's just gonna help my, my beard grow faster. Everything's gonna be alright. Two hours later. You know what, I, I got something to say. Exo Zombies is hella underrated, and, and people didn't give it a chance because YouTubers. Uh, uh, I, I have the sudden urge to to moderate Discord servers. Uh, 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 no, no meme, no memes in general. Uh. Let's get one thing straight here. I don't think Exo Zombies is some underrated masterpiece that was never given a chance. Are there redeeming qualities to this? Absolutely. But is it overall as strong compared to the other Zombies games around it? Well, let's figure that out. 
Exo Zombies, in my eyes, suffers the problem of feeling like just discount Treyarch Zombies without really doing its own thing all that much. And from what I know, Exo Zombies was primarily not even developed by Sledgehammer Games, but by Raven Software. So that may explain why some of the game feels the way it does. To me, Exo Zombies doesn't have the charm of some of the off brand experiences like Infinite Warfare Zombies, even though it has like kind of celebrities for its cast, like Bill Paxton and such. But I have to say, I don't think think they're very good in in these roles and the actors always sound like they don't know what they're doing it's like we're in some stupid horror movie it, it, and it doesn't have the depth in the form of side easter eggs, there aren't boss fights on every map and so on, it's way more so focused on survival, which is totally fine, it just feels a bit lacking in that regard, especially compared to what other modes have brought to the table. Exo Zombies also has the exact same problem I've seen with tons of people that have leveled this at Cold War Zombies. All the maps feel virtually identical, and same is the case here. Each map at the end of the day is just some kind of Atlas facility. Sure, you go from a research lab to to a town to a like carrier boat and then underwater in this like big thing but despite those locations all the aesthetics are still just atlas stuff and that can get a little bogged down especially when played too much and get a bit repetitive and as we know, this game didn't launch with a proper zombies map. DLC 1 would bring the map called Outbreak, and this map is fairly interesting. It's just a small Atlas research facility overrun by zombies. There's an AI system named Angie that guides you along throughout the map. Outbreak also has what I would call a cute main easter egg. It's not that long or even very difficult, and there's even an alternate ending to this easter egg if you do the last step in a very particular way, but it's built very much like a Black Ops 1 map in the sense where it's just a survival map, but there's a small little quest you can do and getting ending if you want to, but you're not punished for not actively pursuing that. There's not a whole lot going on with this map outside of that. It's your basic get perks and guns from the box, except one big change is how Pack-A-Punch works. Traditionally, Pack-A-Punch, obviously, you upgrade your gun typically one to two times for a massive power increase, and that was usually it. But in ExoZombies, across all maps, a gun can be upgraded a total of 20 separate times in 25 if you complete the main easter egg thankfully it's fast and you can see what level your current gun is unlike another game <clears throat> i said unlike another game but still upgrading a weapon 20 to 25 times a match starts to feel a little ridiculous also emz zombies that completely disable your exos can go to hell i actually don't have that much else to say about outbreak it's it's fun enough i suppose the easter egg is decently designed for their first attempt dlc2 however i have different feelings about Infection would be the second map in the Advanced Warfare DLC offering, and this map plays quite different to the previous Outbreak experience in some ways. The setting of this map is a town under Atlas and, and, a, and a built, you know, town overtaken by zombies. And throughout the main Easter egg, you use the Burger Town mascot, Bubby, to help you try and escape. We can't wait to put our meat inside you. That's what Kevin Spacey said. <laughs> Let me read you my list of things I like about Infection. For starters, gathering blood and the golden pan is fun. Uh, I, I guess the Magnetron Wonder Weapon is cool. Um, uh, there's also... Uh, and let's not forget... And, and most importantly... Wow, what an amazing map. Now let's go over the things I hate. EMP zombies. Infected zombies. Escort rounds. The layout. Infected zones, because someone thought that was a good idea. Finding meat spots. Getting the burger thing. Escort rounds. Infected zones. Losing power switches. And the EMP launcher on the guy with the big thing. Basically, there's some neat concepts on this map, but a lot of them are ruined, and it's just a complete slog to play through, especially solo. The Easter egg's fun when things go in your favor, but when they don't, this is a bottom-tier zombies experience easy. It's such a coin toss whether I have a good time when I load this map up or not. I would call it the most inconsistent experience for a map, maybe in Zombies history. But basically, here at the end of the map, Oz gets shot and you have some guy join your team played by uh, Bill Withers, I think? You know, he wets himself. But after the infection easter egg is where things really start to pick up a little bit in terms of map quality and ideas, and that leads us to DLC 3, Carrier. Carrier is one of the more unique locations for a zombies map. Despite it still being on an Atlas boat, this is where they really began to find their footing with main easter eggs, I think, as this one's a lot more complex and involved. Just like infection, this again has so many fun concepts, but a couple of things that completely get in the way for me. Every few rounds, Atlas forces invade the ship and plant a bomb on it, and you pretty much have to attend 
to these and defuse them, and they can also shoot you with literal guns in a zombies mode, and will even drop shot you, like, what the hell, man? Carrier's main strengths are obviously in its main easter egg, like you go to an island for a bit to find a find a thing and then you also get in a shark tank at some point and you get Bev to do a laser puzzle and so on. A lot of fun steps and the wonder weapon's hella unique as well, but besides those elements, there's just really nothing else to do on this map to be honest and it's way better than the previous two maps for sure, but it's still not what I would consider to be great. These maps don't have the personality of something you'd see in like Infinite Warfare for example as an off-brand experience, not to say again it can't be fun but it doesn't have the depth of those other games carrier also made some baffling gameplay choices besides the atlas rounds they also added teleporting zombies into this map and they totally shatter and ruined the flow of normal gameplay even though that's what the emz zombies are for thankfully they don't spawn at a high frequency but they're incredibly annoying when they do besides an interesting quest and the typical exo survival zombies formula it, that, that's basically all there is to Carrier, as far as I'm concerned. It's it's set up to be and lead you into the final map in ExoZombies, and that's where things get the most interesting. So, DLC 4 Descent, apparently to my boy Noah J, is a top 10 zombies map. But Descent, in my opinion, is a low-key banger of a map go back and play it i promise you you will not have a bad time although last time i played it with them i had a legit terrible time so hell that's a top priority uh-huh i got it i did 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 it what taco vlog and died when i completed the puzzle Bob, honestly we might you might need to be a sacrificial lamb for this next round because we literally have to go through another round if we fail this challenge oh no so like uh, if you don't spawn <laughs> next to us, Chop, you just need to take take the L and die. Ladies and gentlemen, what have you known? This man made me pay $120 for this experience. <laughs> chop, as soon as you see that. move challenge, Chop, you just have to stand still. Okay, don't move, Chop. Uh, I'm gonna go make food. I'm so scared. Okay, activate Zombie's your drone. Activate your drone first before you go. Activate your drone. <laughs> this is the descent, dude. I promise you, you will not have a bad time. I promise you, you will not have a bad time. I promise you, you will not have a bad time. I promise you, you will not have a bad time. Basically, the problem with this map is the structure. The layout is almost unplayable. It's really inconvenient to get from one place to another very quickly, especially because of the map being so vertical. At round 10, Oz pulls you into a separate arena where you must survive. In normal gameplay, this doesn't really go anywhere, but if you do the main Easter egg, you have a full-blown boss fight at the end in this room. And granted, it's kind of fun. And, uh, you know, in between that, there's some fun steps to this quest, the jump puzzle and, and the Goliath walkthrough underwater and things like that but by far the coolest part of descent is actually after you've completed the main quest this then gives you access to a mode called double feature which is basically a hardcore version of the map you have almost no hud no quick revive and zombies are much stronger and a bunch of little gameplay adjustments like that just a fun way to crank up the difficulty and have something totally brand new in this experience that's much harder I like Exo Zombies well enough to play it on occasion. It just feels more so like Diet Treyarch instead of really feeling like its own thing that I would give something like Infinite Warfare Zombies credit for. There's no systems like Gobble Gums or Elixirs or Weapon Kits, which is completely fine. Exo Zombies is just a fairly bare bones experience as a whole, and while there are some really solid concepts and things I quite enjoy, it's just not my preferred game to play Zombies on at all. So, how was Advanced Warfare the death of Call of Duty? My point in saying that was, there was a clear fracture in departure in direction with this game, and even its player base. The end of an era was clear as day. Many people gave up on the COD franchise with this release, never to pick it up again, and it did mean a new era for Call of Duty. However, I think a more optimistic view is that it eventually did bring a generation of brand new players into the fold, but after analyzing the game and how it holds up even in modern day, I think the single player is maybe the strongest element of this game. It's actually done very well. The multiplayer is technically not as good as BO3 or IW, I'd argue, when it comes to its mechanics, but as I said, I think I had more fun in Advanced Warfare, at least compared to Infinite Warfare. And Exo Survival is cool, it's, it's not as much fun as MW3 Survival, in my humble opinion, but it's kind of neat grinding for the last map to get that Zombies intro, and finally, Exo Zombies is subpar compared to both Treyarch titles 
titles and infinite warfare zombies but at least this had some kind of relatively fun zombies mode sledgehammer games probably could have had raven not develop this at all and it's certainly better than not having anything in the game but once again nothing really worth writing home about there so this was an interesting game to look at because i forgot how loaded this one actually was but it's given me a lot more perspective about how this changed the call of duty series and where it would move going forward